Hi everyone. Welcome to MoCAD and uh, welcome to this panel that we put together tonight, uh, which is going to be part of an ongoing series uh, we'll have seasonally that's going to choose one of our music programs that we have in that particular season and is going to um, put it in context. <laughs> and ne next season we'll have a, a, ja a panel about uh, avant-garde jazz the night before a performance by uh, Wadada Leo Smith. And that, um, and that should be good. But tonight's panel is, a, is about the history of noise music, placing it in context and making it uh, understandable for those who, who don't know and, and maybe illuminate it a little more for those who do. And uh, to, so to discuss the topic, we have Greg Bays, who is a local promoter and uh, um, encyclopedic music guy and, uh, and DJ. Olivia Zivich, who um, makes visuals and performs as part of the group Demons with, uh, with uh, Nate Young of Wolf Eyes and Steve Kenny of various other bands. And she also runs a, a, an avant-garde music label called Arian A-Hole that puts out AA Records, which puts out a lot of avant-garde recordings and recordings that would be called noise by various people. And then we have Davin Brainerd, who is uh, of the art collective Time Stereo, and the uh, performance art noise troupe, Princess Dragon Mom. And then we have Carrie Lauren, of, uh, who runs BookBeat and is um, part of uh, Monster Island currently and from the 70s uh, in the group Destroy All Monsters, who were uh, considered seminal, perhaps one of the first actual noise bands. <laughs> and then on the end, we have Chip Flynn from um, the group Ape Technology, who uh, perform robotic noise performance music and he'll be doing a demo of some of his um, his noise and making robots over here in a little bit and um, to start the discussion off uh, just to kind of quantify uh, we're going to start out with each person here defining what noise means to them because everybody kind of as you'll see has a different perspective on, on the topic and on the genre and some don't even see it as a genre. And, uh, um, and we urge anyone that if we start getting too esoteric or, or if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt us. You can raise your hand and ask questions and, um, and we'll address whatever, whatever issues or, or ideas or questions you have right then. So um, we're gonna begin by turning on the projector and um, <laughs> and starting with uh, um, a presentation by uh, Greg Bays. Oh, I'm going first? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start with a presentation by Carrie Lauren, who um, will talk about the history of noise as he understands it and kind of the prehistory and different contexts for, the, for what his actions were and perhaps what led us to a contemporary noise scene. So everybody, I'll introduce you to Carrie Lauren. Okay. Uh, I guess I, I'm going to start with a um, presentation with this kind of, I didn't know I was going to do a personal history. I kind of made this as sort of a general uh, history of sound and, and music. And uh, this is a, a record, this first little recording, I'm going to play it a couple times so you can hear it. It's uh, the Big Bang uh, that was, let me see, is it starting? This is uh, a recording done by an astronomer who spent years doing mathematical calculations about distance and time. And uh, I don't know why it's the, it sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> With, with a little more phase on it. Uh, there's also the, a scientist, it, around 2003, they discovered this um, black hole that was emanating sound. And I don't know if anybody heard about this, but it was a, they, they found that the sound that was coming out of the black hole was in B flat, but it was like 57 octaves below C, which is a million times a billion times lower than what we can hear. 
with the human ear. So it's a very low sound, but it's an important sound because they, they, they're now discovering that this is how stars essentially form matter in space. It's because the sound pushes the gas together in, into these waves. And so this wave on the black hole, which, which, it, which you're seeing right here is Perseus, where the black hole is located, and you're seeing these waves essentially forming. And that, this is kind of a new science. So I, I didn't want to begin with ancient Egypt, so I started with, with Greek art, which is basically Egyptian uh, culture, uh, a little bit more slicked up. And Pythagoras was a, was a philosopher who, most, most philosophy is based on his ideas. Uh, and I, I forget what the theorem is. It has to do with the hypotenuse and a triangle, you know, the, the same square sign. Plus B squared equals C a squared, B squared, B squared plus B equals C squared, right. <laughs> Wasn't good in that. I, I don't think any of these samples will, will work. I don't know why. Maybe because they're not on my computer. Oh, there it is. So this, this, this sound that you just heard was this magical theorem put into uh, practice. And so Pythagoras, not much is known about him, but he had a group, a sort of cult of Pythagoreans around him. Who, and we do know about those people. And this, um, this sound is considered their sort of magical <coughs> uh, notation. And all of Western music is basically based on this. It's basically based on octaves and notes, but it's slightly altered. And uh, I'll go to the next slide. This is a picture of Pythagorean, what he called the monochord of the universe. And this image of a, of a string going through the earth at the bottom and going through to the heavens at the top is something he, they considered to be uh, how the world functioned, and all of the uh, planets had different sounds and different vibrations, and this sound of the monochord functions differently with each planet and each uh, um, except they had the sun kind of in them you know they have this all wrong essentially, but it was an idea that later influenced uh, Western occultism and other mu musicians as well. Um, and I had a picture of Blavatsky here because she, she really uh, studied these ideas of Pythagoras. Um, and all of this, and that's why I had the, the little picture of Ra there too, because, um, uh, well, not, not because of the Sun Ra's, um, you know, connection to that, but um, because uh, because all of, this, all of these ideas were also currently in Egypt, but we just don't know about them. They're, they're, they're not very well translated. Um, so this Pythagorean notion of uh, music start, kept going through the Middle Ages, uh, and one of the big alterations, I guess, one of the major ones, was, uh, was St. Hildegard, and they would do chants which had to modulate in steps. You know, they had to go from... Half, half a step at a time. They couldn't jump around. But her, her notation. She was a visionary who had these, you know, uh, visions and ideas and about music. And let me see if this will work. I'm gonna play a little bit of it. Yeah. No. No. Okay. I'm going to go on, but she would jump uh, essentially an octave at a time, sometimes, uh, you know, fifth, f using fists and different, different things. It was kind of, uh, it was kind of the avant-garde of the Middle Ages, uh, Dark Ages, Middle Ages. Um, I'm skipping huge, <laughs> you know, huge advances of time now because, you know, the, I, I don't have a lot of time to give this presentation, but... I, I put these two people in the noise category because one because of Tchaikovsky's you know 1812 overture which uses cannon power in the last uh, uh, you know I don't know five minutes or ten minutes of the of the piece and um, when it's performed live it's quite amazing and really shocking if you've ever heard a cannon uh, someone was just t telling me about watching. Uh, Civil War reenactments, and when you hear the cannon go off, you don't hear it, you feel it, because those things are so powerful, it's just, it goes right through your body, the air, it just moves through the air. Let me see if this works. This is a, um, and Wagner, of course, because of, 
you know, he was just really all about power. And, you know, when you listen to him, you know, he, he just used the drums and the cymbals. And, you know, uh, I think about Apocalypse Now, this scene with the ride of the Valkyries going, you know. And let me see if this, this little piece, uh, again, it's not seeming to function. Let me see. Let's see if I press this. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, Leopold Mozart was the father of, of uh, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and he wrote this little piece that sometimes it's played around Christmas, and it's, uh, it uses whistles and toys and uh, uh, cuckoo clocks and all of these mechanical instruments that uh, was pretty advanced for the 1700s, I guess. Oh, this, this slide may be out of order. Uh, I consider him sort of one of the fathers of modern noise, and he was one of the highest paid, the pedomain, whose real name was Joseph Dujol, could fart, um, use, use his um, rectum to create these incredible noises, and was one of the highest paid um, entertainers in, uh, in French history. And, you know, uh, Unfortunately, I don't think there's any recorded uh, uh, music of his. There's one record, I think, on, on YouTube that you can, we're not sure it's him, but it's from the early 1900s. It's a 78. You can, I think it's a fake, but, but you, you can uh, check that out. Um, so Eric Satie, of course, we mentioned him before as kind of the, one of the, the, the fathers of uh, modern music, and he was, um, I, I almost think, think of, a lot of people think of it as ambient music, too, and it, it, it sort of is. He was sort of deconstructed, uh, you know, if you look at the way he, he would write out, he didn't use time signatures, and, and things were kind of stretched out, and he, and he would use funny uh, instructions to, to give to the uh, performers to play the piece. So uh, he would say, like, you know, I don't know, like... Um, Say this piece 888 times. Oh, yeah, Vexations. Yeah, yeah, Vexations was a piece that you, play, you, play, you, you were supposed to repeat 840 times, and I think that was a... I don't know how John Cage got a hold of that or something in the 40s. Um, but <coughs> And John Cale played... Actually, it gets played now, I think. Um, there are some other ones. And, because oh, Satine never played it. Now. Right, right. Um, this, this is um, kind of of interest to me, this idea about Sines, people that hear, hear uh, colors and stuff when they hear sounds. And it's supposed to be not that rare, but they say maybe 1% of the population has the ability to, to be a, a synesthete, but it could be another thing where you eat something and you, you see the color or, you know, it, there are different types. But the wheel above Scriabin's head are, is his color wheel and it shows you kind of the colors that he would see when he saw sounds. And he was tried to create almost like tone poems that were inspired by Chopin. And he was um, stretching things out. He had a sort of a, a very mystical slant. He was also very inspired by Blavatsky and Theosophy. Uh, and there was a very kind of mystical slant to, to his works. Um, Schoenberg also did, took this 12-tone idea and sort of perfected the math to it, and um, I, I don't really understand the whole thing myself, but it's like, um, they say it's based on uh, surreal, serialism, which is the, the, fa the fact that you have to play each of the tones before you can repeat a tone, so that, so that that's where the 12 tone uh, concept comes off. And if, when, you, when you do hear it, I don't know if there's, uh, let me see if that'll work. That was a, a, a link to a, a website. Each piece was to be created from a specific ordering of the 12 pitches of the chromatic scale, called 12-tone row. The melodic and harmonic dimensions of a work were thus derived from this Grundgestalt, or basic shape. To ensure the integrity of this 12-tone universe, no pitch was to be repeated until all the remaining 11 had been sounded. It reminds me of... Um, Film music. When I hear, when I hear Sean Gray a lot, I always think of suspense, kind of emotion. It was great.
great. He's really an interesting painter too. A lot of a lot of these uh, musicians did interesting art um, as well. Uh, I'll go back to this. Let's see where I was. Um, um, this uh, idea about well, I want to say one thing about the 19th century before I go, go into 20th century stuff is that um, this one idea of symbolism that was um, in poetry, in the works of Mallarmé and, and different artists like uh, Gustave Moreau was a very forceful, was like the great idea of that time, of, of, the, of the 19th century. And it's, it was so great. It's, it's almost overshadowed everything in the 20th century when you think about it. Um, that's, that symbolist, uh, the ideas that, that were laid out at that time would, would also come up into Dadaism, into Surrealism, into all of the, the, the modern, the, the so-called modern aesthetic uh, that we know in the 20th century. And somebody who saw that was um, Marinetti, and he developed, um, you know, a type of poetry and a kind of, uh, 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 I guess, a group. You know, he had a, a bunch of like, like mind. This is Rossello on the on the end here, the uh, composer and painter. I think this is Bala, and this is Marinetti. Not sure who who the rest are. Um, and th this is some of this is the painting of um, Giacomo Bala, uh, 1910. They tried to express sound and speed and and all of these things at once, kind of um, um, using color as, and as as a kind of uh, as a kind of tone poem as, itself, as a kind of expression of sound. Um, um, this is um, some of the participants of Dadaism at the Cabaret Voltaire. This is Hugo Ball here, who was one of the, the founding mem members of Zurich uh, Dada. I don't know if this will come out. This is a, maybe, no, I don't think these links are working. But this is uh, uh, Kurt Schwitter's uh, uh, doing Urso Night. But, but there's also a really, uh, there's, a, there's really a better one of, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, Marie Osmond, uh, the Osmond singers, doing doing this same poem on live TV. You can, uh, I think it's on the Ubu web. You can like hear her sing. It's quite quite amazing. It's a little feat. <coughs> and so what what they were doing, what uh, Schwitters was doing in, in typography and magazine work at the bottom is is kind of similar to this breakup of language and. Uh, and I don't know if this is this, if I should even try this, but this was a little sample of. Um, Antonin Artaud, who was the founder of the um, Theater of Cruelty and was kind of an explorer in all these fields of uh, drama and um, uh, performance art. And he went to, uh, he would go on these very strange trips to like Mexico and take hallucinogens or he, he went to um, Bali once to, to witness uh, gamelan playing and he would like combine all these things into his, um, into his works, into his studies, and into his manifesto called The Theater of Cruelty. He was also an actor, and he was in, uh, this is him in jo uh, Joan of Arc, um, Ren is it Jean Renoir, right? Is it the director? No, best, yeah, Theodore uh, tries, is it, I don't, I don't know, I can't remember who did this. Google, we'll Google it. Okay. Henry Cowell was another kind of uh, very eccentric, uh, turn-of-the-century bohemian. His parents were these uh, very kind of wild artist writers. And he was, um, I hope this will play because this is a web link. Maybe, maybe this will be interesting. Um, the Banshee. He would do these uh, things he called tone clusters, which were these big um, 
uh, you know, using his fists and arms and stuff uh, to lay on to the piano. And he, um, he was also another guy that was involved in theosophy. I'm going to go back to him for just a second. He was also involved in the uh, Blavatsky's, um, Blavatsky's work. And he um, commissioned um, Leon Theremin, the inventor of the, in 1930, uh, one of the first electronic instrument makers, to make him a, an instrument. And he called it the Rhythmicon. And it was the first drum box, essentially. And it was the Rhythmicon could play 16 patterns all at once. And it was um, an invention of Henry Cowles that there were only three of these made. I don't think any exist today. Um, but the composer um, or producer, Joe Meek, in the 1960s, researched this guy very thoroughly and studied him and, and, tr and tried to uh, recreate the, the uh, Rhythmicon. Uh, I do have another piece. I could see if this will work. Because Carl, Carl doesn't really get talked about too much, and i just sorry to, you know, s spend a lot of time on him. Let's see if I can play this. Um, the ultra-moderns, yeah, and there's part of this uh, group of Edgar Verres, let me ring a bell, Edgar Verres and uh, who else was in there, uh, Ruth Crawford and Carl Ruggles. Um, besides John Cage, George uh, Gershwin studied with him, so an important guy. Uh, go back to my uh, thing here. Um, moving along, Harry Parch is, is somebody that um, he called himself um, uh, really a carpenter he, he, or a, um, a music man seduced into carpentry. And he, he created his own instruments and he was quite a do-it-yourself uh, musician as well and philosopher about music. And where there was a 12-tone idea, he created 42 tones uh, on his own instruments, and uh, he composed music. He, he, he was a hobo in the 1930s for 10 years. He wrote uh, uh, a journal called Bitter Music about those years um, living in poverty, and that's still in print. There's a, a, a site called Innova Music uh, that you can go to. I think it's part of Indiana University, and you can go and you can look at all. They, they just document that that one um, business documents everything that he did. And so there are films and all sorts of uh, interesting things. I'm going to play just a little piece. This is, I don't know if it'll work, this YouTube. And Verus, um, of course, was one of the first electronic uh, musicians, composers. And I learned about him when I was very young from an album called uh, Freak Out by uh, Frank Zappa that came out in 1966. And on that album, everybody learns music backwards because there's so much history to know. And so, you know, all we immediately know is popular music and what's around, what our friends are listening to. So we don't really we have to go backwards into time constantly to, to teach ourselves what, where this shit came from. And so, of course, um, I started to 
to go through all the names on that album called Freak Out, and there's about 150 of them. And I, I Googled it, and I came up with um, uh, Don Was did a whole like, like thing about that, that album, too. So I think it influenced a lot of people. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, musicians went through it. And because every musician he mentioned in that uh, album cover was more interesting than his own music, actually, and, and, was mu and it led to other things as well. And so um, let me see if this will work. Probably not because it's, a, it's not Im embedded correctly or something. But um, this is really, actually, ionization is, is more of a percussion uh, piece anyways, so we'll skip that. Um, these guys are not really musicians, but they're writers, um, William S. Burroughs and, and Geisen. Um, also, paint, you know, paint, Geisen did painting, some kind of calligraphy stuff, um, and he invented this thing called the Dream Machine, some people have heard about, you know, because... Uh, um, who's a guy in Nirvana, like, used to stare at it, or Kurt Cobain or something. So, no, what's it say? Kurt, Kurt Cobain, like, shot himself after he looked at it. We could start all sorts of rumors. Here. But uh, <clears throat> I think they're interesting because of their, the main thing is this cut-up method that they both developed at the same time, this idea of, like, chopping up their text and then rearranging it. And I think that that was, like, a really major... Um, uh, breakthrough uh, for that time uh, when you know Jack Kerouac was writing on the road and all these things were coming out. These guys were almost like a light year ahead of time uh, doing that uh, with the cut-up method. They also did it in there is a I think a recording called Poem Poem Within Poem or something that, that they did. Um, and of course, Sun Ra, I think any any noise sound uh, discussion has to has to talk about him a little bit. Um, I first knew about him from this record, Heliocentric Worlds, from, um, actually it was from a whole bunch of ESP records that uh, my friend Jim Shaw had, who was in Destroy All Monsters, and he kind of edu he, he kind of picked up everything. He had just the hugest record collector collection, and usually that's how you find out about stuff, is like who, well, how, back then, uh, was like who had, the, who had the most interesting record collection. And so it was always Jim, and we'd always rifle through his stuff and like find things and uh, discover what we liked. And um, Sun Ra did play in Ann Arbor quite a bit. And I think one thing he'll be known for is this idea of Afrofuturism, this idea um, that he came up with in the 1950s, a kind of exploration of sound into the future and uh, space travel uh, mixed with like hard bop and modal sources of music. Um, it was, there's also a movie called Space is the Place. You could see and kind of get an idea of what this was. This would in influence funk and George Clinton and the mothership idea. Um, a lot of other people as well. The, um, you know, what was the mothership connection. Um, also Derek May and Juan Atkins are probably another thread that go through this as techno at, at one end of it. There are also some really abstract um, uh, compositions that I like, or recordings. Uh, there's one called Strange Strings, which is, uh, all, he gave a, everyone in his group a stringed instrument. Am I going way too, is this going way too long? Uh, I, I should get out of here soon. I'm going to maybe skip Fluxus. How about that? Uh, maybe, maybe that'll, that'll, uh, it, I think the once group, Fluxus is something you can find out about. The once group is kind of interesting from Ann Arbor. It was a group of composers and artists. Uh, a guy named Milton Cohen did light shows. Um, and that goes, even goes back to Scriabin, who, had, who was interested in light shows with his work. Um, he had a thing called Space Theater uh, that he worked, Robert Ashley, and his long kind of poems. Um, Lamont Young and the kind of New York School of Lost, I, I call it the Lost School, but uh, I don't know if there's a word for it. Uh, conceptualism, minimalism. Uh, but this drone uh, kind of uh, thing became really controversial with uh, Tony Conrad's release uh, about, uh, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago. Um, he came out with um, works that he studied that basically he re-recorded a lot of Lamont Young's pieces and Lamont was very angry about it. There's a big, the dream house is a place where um, they keep these, uh, 
performances happening in New York. Um, this is Angus McLeese at the top here. He was a, he was a member of this uh, group with Tony Conrad and John Cale from the, um, well, John Cale was in the uh, Velvet Underground here. And that's the connection between Lou Reed, who, when, it, when this came out, I wasn't thinking about uh, minimalism or uh, what, what, it, what Lamont Young was doing. I didn't know who Lamont Young was, but I knew about the Velvet Underground. And that was uh, an important record, I think, for in, in noise at that time. Um, ben, ben seems to think it was a joke album. I think, I think it was maybe, or did you say something like that, or was it a practical joke or something? Well, it might be. I, I don't really know. I, don't, I never heard, re but there's, there's all sorts of discussions about it. I think, I think of it as similar to what Lamont was doing, and I think it was kind of a statement about, about that maybe. Um, ESP Records, again, I wanted to, to mention the influence of these kind of, under, you know, these kind of subculture uh, record labels that were really important to you know, my universe. Um, and the Detroit Artist Workshop, they would always run ESP record uh, advertisements in their, in their journals and flyers. And this is James Seamark, who is a composer. He just passed away. Um, and he, was, he invented this thing called rhythm ballads, a kind of proto-hip-hop thing in the late 50s uh, um, in Detroit with... Um, musicians from the artist workshop, this John Sinclair and some other things. Um, they also would promote a lot of uh, free jazz concerts in, in the area of Detroit with um, Joseph Jarman especially would, would, would hang out here quite a bit uh, in the 60s. And um, the Art Ensemble was one of Mike Kelly's favorite bands. And you could hear like the squeeze toy, the kind of the aesthetic that Mike would really adopt in his music in uh, Destroy All Monsters through this um, ensemble and the idea of these strange um, sounds. Um, Ohm was also like a really um, important album for me. It was kind of the first, to me it wasn't the first free jazz, but to me it was probably the first total out there album that I, I had ever heard. Uh, supposedly recorded on LSD, but I don't, don't know if that's true or not. And then of course Freak Out, uh, which led to a lot of other things and a lot of uh, you know other underground uh, discoveries through that album. I talked about that before. Um, and this is my last slide. I just want to mention, um, this, is, this is a photograph of me and Shaky Jake on the street. Shaky was really a, a, a big influence in, the, in my group and in the music that I did because he was really the most freeform guy. He operated, you know, he had a guitar but it had no strings. And he would get up and, you know, start doing a song and he would go into a rap, which would go into a story, which would go back to the song. And it was just, he was kind of like the wild man Fisher of uh, Ann Arbor during the day. And we just, he would hang out. He would come into our house and just, you know, hang out. And he, he always looked great. He, you know, he has that cape that's like a, um, a I don't know, like a... Uh, a tablecloth or something around, you know, he just had this style with the bow tie and the glasses and, and you know, um, the shoes and everything. This guy was super slick and he'd always have tons of rings on his fingers. Uh, they both played at this show, I think it was the 73 Ann Arbor uh, Festival. I don't know if this will, um, this is a, a little recording that I got from John Sinclair. I'll just play a second, that'll be it. Did I go past? I'm gonna do my thing, dog. I'm gonna do it my way. So here it is. Baby, tell me why. Tell it wasn't why. You love my baby all night. We were fun. I cry your eyes. Let me love you, baby. Let me hold your hand. Please don't cry. You love me, God. Tell me, baby. I know that if you love me, baby. Okay, let me, let me, uh, if I got, if I got one more second, I'm going to just play this little clip of, uh, of, uh, One String Sam. There you go, real, I'll just play, play one minute and then I'll, we'll end it. She's, uh, playing with a Gerber baby bottle. You know, I talked with mother this morning. Mother talked with the judge. 
I couldn't be a eavesdrop, you know. On a spiritual word, she said, I need in the column. You know I do. You know I need a hundred dollars. Just a cold mile, my baby's gone. Does anyone have any questions for Carrie? I know a lot of references were made that perhaps not everybody grabbed. Michael? I mean, you could go on. I, you could go on for like days up here, you know, and talk about. Of course, I love Captain Beefheart, and like he was like he. To you know, I went out to see him. Like in the, I hitchhiked to California to go to go see the guy. I mean, there was like millions of people I could talk about nonstop. You know, but it's just like I had like I figured 25 slides, and I was thinking like maybe a minute or, <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, there's still plenty of discussion left, Michael. All right, so so moving on from there, the next presentation will be by uh, Greg Bays. So wel welcome him. Hi everybody. Um, I really enjoyed. Your presentation, Carrie. I, I, I learned a lot, and, and I, I'm gonna have to, check, have to check out more Stanley Cowell for sure. Um, one thing that Carrie mentioned, and it's kind of, I'm, I'm a music lover. I'm a record collector. I like all kinds of stuff, and to me, it's all music. Um, no, uh, music is organized sound. That's uh, something that was really important to John Cage. It might not, sound, the composition might not sound the same way twice but it still had a pattern, an organization, a structure, um, people working to create these sounds, both musicians and non-musicians. Um, and Kerry mentioned that we learned history backwards, and whenever I hear something, I'm always interested, what were the antecedents to this? Where did these sounds come from? Um, I remember once, we'll see them in a little bit, this band from Hamilton, Ontario, said that they were the world's first or world's first or world's oldest noise band um, and they're, they're, they're awesome they're great they're called the nihilist spasm band but i wrote an article about them once and the first words were luigi russolo of the italian futurists would probably beg to differ but um there's a lot of stuff out there nowadays that we have access to that was just hearsay or mentioned in liner notes before. Now we've got it all at our fingertips and this is a, you know, a great opportunity to do some, some exploring. Um, for me, um, noise, the noisier side of music, can be anything from somebody fooling around with a contact mic, scraping it across the floor, or it could be a modern composer doing a really beautiful, ecstatic, psychedelic drone piece like Lamont Young or Phil Niblock. Uh, and there's, there's just so much room and variance in there, and uh, th there's, I mean, there's probably some stuff out that's out there that's boring, but you, you find what you're attracted to, you find what you like, and that's what you, uh, you track down. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in, because, you know, I was younger, listened to a lot of rock and roll, still do, is the influences on a lot of uh, more avant-garde rock and roll bands, especially in the 60s, you, you would read about uh, people like Lamont Young being an influence on the Velvet Underground or AMM being an influence on Pink Floyd. Um, and when you start to study these things, you realize that there are these people that they weren't rock bands at all. Maybe once in a while they would be programmed in a, to play in a rock and roll venue with rock and roll bands, but they weren't playing rock music at all. They were doing um, modern electronic, live electronic music, modern classical music, uh, a lot of improv improvisation. Uh, they were bringing to the stage and creating a performance element about to a lot of things that were just happening in sound laboratories across Europe and in academies and universities in America, and also stuff that only existed on tape. The, the Musique Concrète folks from France who would 
record sounds and manipulate them and alter them and make these otherworldly sounds that you couldn't really make live yet. They didn't have the technology, but eventually people wanted, inspired by this stuff, they wanted to create a live performance element. There, there would be tape music concerts and people would roll the tape and that was it. Um, so people translated the avant-garde ideas, the collage ideas, the sound manipulation ideas to the stage, uh, beginning with people like John Cage and uh, continuing into the 60s and beyond. You'd have people playing uh, conventional instruments in unconventional ways. You'd have people who created their own unique sound, uh, their own instruments, their own uh, musical scales and uh, different ways of creating scores and instructions for performers. You'd have people experimenting with volume, with amplified sound, being really loud or really soft too. A lot of noise music's quiet. Um, sometimes performers would improvise or the, the composer would allow them to improvise. That would be part of the instructions. Um, and sometimes there would, you know, it would, be, it would be scored and you could recognize routines or pieces, even though they were uh, very noisy. Um, and this was happening in a bunch of different pockets. And you know, 30 years ago, you had, you had to be a really voracious record collector to find these albums and these recordings by these people. Nowadays, you can just go on the internet and listen to them. I'm not going to play any of them for you, but uh, let's look at some pictures. Uh, in the UK, there was AMM, which was a group led by Cornelius Cardew, and they, even though they had jazz instrumentation, they weren't coming from a jazz tradition. They were trying very conscientiously to not work in any tradition at all. They were just trying to make sound for sound's sake. Um, and I, I can't really get into it right now, but Cornelius Cardew had a, a leftist political agenda. It was very important to him. It was very important for him to uh, kind of treat music as an egalitarian society. He also led the Scratch Orchestra, which was a bunch of people, both musicians and non-musicians, who would get together and create their own musical scores and instructions. I, 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 this might be a Fluxus piece, but it might, I think it's actually a, a Scratch Orchestra piece. It's tune a brook by moving the stones in the brook as the water passes by. Things like that, and also more um, concentrated events that would call for people who knew how to play their instruments and people who didn't. I think out of this also came the Portsmouth Symphonia, which were a bunch of musicians and non-musicians, none of whom were playing the instruments that they knew how to play, tackling the classics like the Hallelujah Chorus and the Ode to Joy and stuff on uh, pretty great stuff. So that's a and We'll come back to them in a little bit. We also have uh, Musica, Musica Electronica Viva, which were some mostly American expatriates living in Italy that tempered their um, repertoire with both freeform improvisation, very noisy stuff with a person who now lives in Detroit named Alan Bryant who would make homemade synthesizers in the mid-60s. Uh, and also they would work on some also more composed pieces, which kind of led to a schism in the band uh, or the, in, the in the group. Some people want to do the, compo the composed pieces and some people just want freeform improvisation. Here they are playing with the American soprano saxophonist Steve Lacey. In Italy, there was the Gruppo di Improvisazione di Nuova Consonanza, which were a bunch of Italian composers who got together to jam without preconceived ideas. Um, one of the composers and performers involved was Ennio Morricone, the film, uh, the film composer who did the theme song for The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and so many other things. And he, he was doing, working on this concurrently with all his great soundtrack work. And sometimes in more obscure films, it would seep into what he was doing in the film world. In Japan, there was the group Ongaku, who uh, were pretty much analogous to what the people in AMM and MEV were doing, but then they kind of, in the late 60s and early 70s, 
uh, transformed through their, le through their leader, Takehisa Kasugi, into this kind of psychedelic drone band called uh, the Taj Mahal Travelers. And they would, you know, they were long-haired hippies and would go to rock festivals and just play really long, extensive psychedelic drone music. Yes? Oh, uh, Group Angaku. That was back when they all had short hair in the early 60s. And then uh, when they all became a bunch of freaks, they, you know, they would travel Europe in a microbus just like a rock band, but they weren't playing rock music. They were playing this uh, really great, you know, not noisy at all. It's very, uh, you know, peaceful and interesting, for the most part, drone music. Uh, from Hamilton, Ontario, it's the Nihilist Spasm Band, who I think like every Monday night since 1965, if they're all in town, they get together at a neighborhood bar and jam on homemade instruments and uh, chants, uh, sound poetry. They're pretty, uh, a pretty amazing band. They, they, about 10 years ago, they came down to Detroit a couple of times and very, uh, very entertaining. And also, Karlheinz Stockhausen, who uh, early in his career was working in studios with electronic equipment, uh, recording live, uh, live electronic stuff in studios, and also working a lot with uh, tape music as well, uh, tape collage. Uh, but in the mid-60s, he put together a group to perform, uh, to, to perform this music live. And uh, when he would have these live performances, this is a group that got together to perform a piece called Shortwave, and four of the performers all had shortwave radios, and uh, there were different instructions on how to play them, how to tune, and when to turn the channel. Uh, but you can't control what's playing on the shortwave radio. And uh, so there's this element of chance, of surprise. Uh, sometimes they react to it, sometimes they don't. Um, but uh, Stockhausen was, uh, in the avant-garde, a really big, uh, a big figure, a big theorist. Um, and we'll see in a little bit that um, in many cases in the 60s, there, the avant-garde found itself crossing over into the world of rock and roll. This the, first, the first reason I heard any of these names was because of the rock and roll music I was, I was listening to. And I went backwards. And, and nowadays there's so much stuff out there, it's, it's, it's easy to find. And, if you're interested in what you've been hearing discussed tonight, you should definitely uh, check it out. So, uh, AMM, in 19, AMM 1966, there, they actually had the same manager as Pink Floyd. They would share bills with Pink Floyd. And the, their, some of their ideas would find themselves in Pink Floyd's music, specifically the middle part of the song, Interstellar Overdrive, where the song just totally, it starts off as like this great rock and roll song, and then the song just disappears. And there's just these clouds of sound and plucking strings for about six or seven minutes. And it could, it could very easily have been AMM making those sounds. Uh, there's Pink Floyd. Back when Sid Barrett was still in band here too, you know. They're messing around in the studio with some, uh, some drums. Uh, Lamont Young and Marion Zazila and the Theater of Eternal Music, they, from the early 60s, were experimenting with very loud amplified sound, drones, alternative tunings, and what most people are used to listening to, and psychedelic light, light shows. I mean, back in the, the early 60s, um, the, working with stuff that we would associate with the, the vocabulary of rock concerts in the late 60s, they were doing it earlier, and uh, they were also a really big influence on uh, the, the Velvet Underground through John Cale's participation in the theater of eternal music, and uh, their, you know, their, their whole friends, Angus McLeese, who performed with the Velvet Underground, he was a founding member of the Velvet Underground, also performed with uh, the theater of eternal music. Um, when there's uh, an apocryphal story when John Cale and Tony Conrad, who also played with Lamont Young, first met Lou Reed, Tony Conrad and John Cale were c coming out of working with Lamont Young, and they all had these really precise mathematical ideas on how to tune their instruments. And they meet Lou Reed, and he has his guitar tuned almost the exact same way, but there's, for him there was no math behind it. He just said, by tuning it like this, making them all more or less the same string, it makes it easier for me to play the guitar. 
it's the velvets. And then um, from the world of the, the sound laboratories and the music concrete tape stuff uh, that was happening in the 50s and 60s, uh, that influenced the Beatles. And on the White Album, they had their uh, composition Revolution Number no. 9, which I don't think I've ever heard on commercial radio. And it's probably the most reviled Beatles song of all time. Um, yeah, that's, see, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intro to, uh, to, to noise. I mean, even if you don't think you have heard noise, there you, there you go. It's, it's right there on the White Album. That's, you know, come to think of this, it, probably one of the first noise pieces I've heard, too. That or, you know, all those crazy uh, boat and motor sounds at the beginning of Sea Cruise by Frankie Ford. Uh, we hear the legacy of these innovators and the noise performers of today. You've got a tradition of people who are not musicians that don't read music, but they're able to create uh, sound pieces, sound art, um, just like you know, using these raw materials, just like a painter or a sculptor or any other artist would. Um, let's see here. Uh, this was taken late last year. This is Chris Pottinger of uh, Cotton Museum with a table full of electronics. Uh, making a bunch of noise at public pool in Hamtramck. And, uh, you know, a couple, uh, you know, like two years earlier, I saw Takahisa Kasugi, and his rig, even though it had a bigger mixing board, it wasn't that much different than what Chris had. It had a bunch of, you know, a ton of fax pedals and sine wave generators and oscillators uh, making, making sonic art in real time. Um, I want to leave you with this quote. Uh, the, the, there was a, there's, well, still is a, an industrial noise band called Nurse with Wound, who they, they seem to be musically omnivorous too. And on their very first or second release, they put a huge list of all, just like Frank Zappa did, they put out this, like this huge list, list of obscure bands that people have been trying to track down and check out ever since then. Uh, and it, it was all kinds of stuff. It was everything from Chilean nose flute players to, uh, to modern classical people to rock and roll people. And they were just all presented in alphabetical order uh, with the caption, categories strain, crack, and sometimes break under their burden. Step out of space provided. To me, noise came from Japan. I started working at a record store in 1989 and was, of course, exposed to all kinds of music and all kinds of music catalogs and distributors that were supplying stores with all this music. And there was a distributor from San Francisco called Subterranean. And uh, Eldon M. worked there. Uh, he became a friend. And um, he turned me on to all this music from Japan, Japanese noise music. Mersbo and Incapacitance and um, Hannah Trash were the main players. Uh, that inspired me and my friends to start Princess Dragon Mom in 1993, um, very much influenced by the Japanese noise music. Um, and of course, there's, you know, I'd never heard metal machine music, I'd never heard the Velvet Underground. I never even heard the Stooges at the time, so all of that might have played into what the Japanese guys were hearing, um, but it didn't, that's not where I came from. Um, so I've prepared a six minute video, um, starting with Japanese noise music, there's two minutes of that, there's two minutes of American noise music, um, and then there's two minutes of my band uh, with several friends, Princess Dragon Mom. Um, and uh, most of the footage is footage that I shot, so I was fortunate to have been able to see a lot of these bands live. There's, there's not too much, so here goes. And uh, there's a little problem with the audio. It's a little out of sync, but uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Actually, this clip is supposed to be really loud, but uh, something happened. Gonna get loud.
as you may see, the, we're beginning to reach the distinction between what perhaps is avant-garde music and, and noisy music and, and, and actual noise. Um, and with that being said, we're going to skip ahead real quick because uh, Chip has a timeline. And he's, gonna, um, he's brought some uh, noise-making devices here uh, that he's going to tell you a little bit about and demo for you really quickly. And, um, and it's important to, to say that the reason he, uh, we're having this discussion is because we have a performance tomorrow night uh, featuring Michael Deck, who's sitting right there, Lichens, <laughs> and, uh, and Hunting Lodge and Ape Technology, which uh, Hunting Lodge is uh, an industrial group, which is a subgenre of its own. And uh, Chip will be performing with them tomorrow night, uh, 10 o'clock. So come on out if you're curious. And now Chip Lynn. Hello. Recently, I've been in, uh, interested in the work of Luigi Rosolo. And uh, these are two machines that we built. And the interesting thing about his work was is a lot of the compositions he did had to do with the Industrial Revolution and a bunch of new sounds that came apart because of the clanks and the whooshes and the weird sounds that had never been heard before. So recently we've been building machines to replicate kind of his work and his ideas. So the two machines we have here is one's called the uh, standing wave machine. That's the one with the string. The other one's called the salad shooter, which is kind of a silly name, but it uh, came apart. Uh, one, of the, one of the guys over here, Leith Campbell, and his, uh, his daughter were playing with marbles in a bowl. So it made an interesting sound. And then... Uh, yeah, the standing wave machine is basically a machine that has a rotating uh, servo motor that resonates the string, that resonates the drum, and then it has a whammy bar here, which is a variable speed motor that gives it a warble and a strange sound. So I'm going to demonstrate it right now. Thank you. We're going to go load up about a thousand pounds of junk for tomorrow, so you guys should come check it out for sure. Thanks. All right, so um, as you've seen, we're, we're exploring uh, different genres and different ideas in, in sound and sound art. And, uh, and you know, we're, we're 
we've moved from the what we would all mutually discuss as kind of the prehistory of noise into the kind of um, the beginning of noise as a genre, which would be the Japanese noise and American noise music, and um, to kind of bring us into the contemporary age where these things are kind of known through a series of subgenres and, and micro genres and, and uh, mini movements is uh, Olivia Zivich of Demons and AA Records. We kind of went over a lot of the older stuff, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, and just to clarify one thing, um, Ben, you had said that, I said, you know, I don't really consider AA a noise label. Um, you said avant-garde, but actually I consider it an experimental music label. Um, avant-garde kind of being part and parcel with modernism, so, you know, experimental, I feel, is kind of more like the contemporary term for it. Um, so... Ann Arbor got mentioned really briefly, um, the once group. Um, that's kind of like my background, and a lot of people I know were from the Ann Arbor area, a lot of people I know in the noise, Michigan, especially noise um, world. And it's, I don't think, like, you know, growing up there, anyone really knew exactly about the once group. Um, but it, it, there definitely was, like, a feeling in the air, I think, um, beyond just a college town feeling, Ann Arbor was like really fertile ground for um, experimentation. I don't know, maybe it's because hash bash happens there, I don't know. But um, one of the people, one of the per person who I think got a lot of people I know into this kind of music was Jim Magus, and uh, he was part of a group called Couch, so I just want to play a few seconds of that, uh, Couch in 1995. actually purchase stuff that some of the young uh, noise musicians in Ann Arbor would make to sell at Borders, which was, you know, kind of insane. These are like releases made out of uh, FedEx envelopes and, you know, stolen copies from Kinko's. Um, so I think that kind of opened the door for a lot of people involved in this music to realize basically that they could make some money doing this. Um, and that's kind of my interest in it, not just making money, but in the, this idea of this niche economy that um, supports itself um, and is essentially a way for affordable artwork to be made and um, exchanged as a commodity um, in today's world, and which has just made all of them easier through the Internet, but back in the day it actually had to be done all through mail order, um, you know, and God forbid, using the telephone. <laughs> and, uh, and then I just wanted to play also some other kind of music that I saw really, you know, like Dave Bixby played this week at the Auger House, and he played um, some really amazing, um, I guess you call it kind of like loner folk music, um, which is, I think, very influential on a lot of noise musicians. And um, it, then he went on to play... Um, some cover songs of like Eric Clapton and stuff. And it reminded me that, you know, even people that make the most obscure music have rather 
mainstream taste. So this is some of the music that I think influences that which we call noise currently. And this is Negative Approach, also a Michigan band. If I can get it to play. Turn his mic up, way up. This is Negative Approach at No Phone, which is a noise festival. Um, they were kind of a surprise guest, and I think you'll see by how crazy the crowd goes. They're probably the band most, everyone was most excited to see that weekend. You know, just to kind of point out that um, I think noise has a pretty big root in um, punk um, and also in black metal. tonality is happening. Um, okay, just going to skip ahead here. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, but I think I'm going to have to skip ahead a little bit because I already covered a lot of ground. Um, let's see. Right. So, okay. This is another, getting back to objects, this is probably one of the most influential objects in the world of noise. It's the folding table. Um, essentially, a folding table uh, as a noise musician, okay, any musician has to, has to tour to make money. You don't make money really off of record sales. Um, so, as a noise musician, you know, because you're not playing with these uh, standard drum, bass, uh, guitar type uh, instruments all the time, a folding table is kind of like your best friend because it folds a flat. You can fit it into your car very easily. It can be your merch table and to, you know, by which you sell your merchandise and make money. It can be the table to which you actually attach all of your equipment so that you don't have to set it up, patch, pedal, system time and time after again. Um, Greg brought up Cot Museum, Chris Pottinger. Um, he's kind of famous for his pedals always being attached to his folding table, um, which then kind of becomes part of the performance. Itself.
well as you can see everything. Packed and, uh, at times the table even gets lifted up by the audience. <laughs> Um, getting back to the releases, oh, and also folding tables are known as survival units. Okay, so getting back to releases, I actually have a Cotton Museum uh, release here. Um, so there's a lot of different labels out there, and um, to me, one of the more interesting things is the formats that people create to release their music on. Um, here's a Cotton Museum release, and um, Chris is really good at getting his stuff to look really slick. Um, this is just a CD attached to the back of this die cut um, and printed piece of uh, plastic, I believe. And then it's been um, nicely packaged to kind of look, I mean, it looks a lot like a toy, really. Um, this is kind of the more slick and maybe more playful looking aspects of, uh, of a noise label release. Um, right here, right here, I've got a release by Mud Boy. Um, an artist out of Providence. Um, he kind of came out of the whole um, Rhode Island School of Design scene. Um, also, Black Dice and um, Lightning Bolt came out of the Fort Thunder um, scene. And a lot of that had to do with um, a pretty serious commitment to like a DIY culture and also to, um, to creating um, artworks to be available to people um, outside of the world, art world of, um, you know, galleries and uh, collectors. Um, so this is Mud Boy. He um, would perform in this. It's called a terror shroud. And um, he also created his own organ. And then, um, again, in a, in a kind of interesting twist of economics, he decided that he would sell both the terror shroud and the organ so that you too could be Mud Boy and um, do your own Mud Boy show. So the terror shroud was like $20, but the organ was like $5,000. So this is the terror shroud. And it is kind of terrifying. What's in the envelope? The envelope is basically just the instructions, the instructions, terror shroud. Raphael Mudboy, he also, um, I mean, now it's pretty common to get a code to, in order to download um, a release. He didn't really want to take part in any of the, the corporate websites um, that do that, so he hired a programmer to, so he could create his own uh, limited download website. Um, again, just kind of maintaining control on a sort of DIY level of um, the distribu distribution of um, one's work. So I'm just going to go over some more of these releases um, that I think are interesting. So American Tapes is probably the uh, premier noise label. Um, they just recently, it's John Olson of Wolf Eyes. Um, he just recently did his 900th release, which was, actually wasn't a release. It was um, a show. He did a show as the 900th release. Um, and um, I think that just kind of exemplifies um, what can be considered as a music release. Um, this is actually the same release. Um, it's a Wolf Eyes release. It's American Tapes number 740. Um, so two totally look different but looking boxes, but it's the same release. And um, these are actually, you know, recycled boxes of his own. These are coffee, this is like a coffee filter box, and this was like a, one of those... 100 calorie snack packs boxes and um, you know low overhead recycling I think these are both really important uh, aspects of um, independent DIY labels um, you know putting out a record is really expensive you're looking at anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars and then you're stuck with at least 250 copies of something um, you know if you can't move those copies you've got to eat that cost so this is a really great way of putting your music out there for as many people are, uh, are interested, but, or you know, maybe you, this is a limited edition to 20, maybe you uh, aren't interested in the fact that maybe 500 people want a copy, maybe you just want 20 people to have this particular release. Um, so again, just, uh, you know, I, I just think it's a great way in order to um, avoid the, the pitfalls of putting out things 
via manufacturing, um, which can eat up a lot of money, and then you're just kind of stuck with this sort of traditional release um, that if you don't have enough people interested in hearing it, well, you know, you just have a lot of records sitting in your living room. Um, by making your own release, um, I mean, you can make... You can, <laughs> some people take the orders and then they see how many orders they get and then they make the release to however many orders they got. Um, it's just a really interesting mode of um, economic exchange. This is a, uh, yeah, go ahead. Say that again? Oh, I think there's um, two cassettes and uh, probably a CDR in each one of those. It's a box set. Um, this is another American Tapes release, and this was put out in conjunction with a group called Weird Shadow. Um, a member of Weird Shadow, um, his family owns Eden Foods in Clinton, Michigan, makers of the soy milk and the, um, I don't know, Edzuki beans and whatnot. And obviously they have a canning facility, so this is a cassette tape inside of a can, um, limited to 100. And no, I have not opened it. <laughs> Another American Tapes release. This is just um, some artwork and a CD glued directly to an LP. No sleeve or anything. Um, this is what is this? American Tapes 186. Um, I just think this is a really great way of putting out an LP. What, what my label does, uh, rather than um, press records, is we cut the records by hand one at a time on a machine known as a lathe. Again, you know, we can just do like 20 at a time that way. It's a really great way of putting out 7-inch without having to go to all the expense. Um, so we put out, we've put out about um, close to 30 lathes. Um, after we put out the first 13, we put them together as a box set, and then we also put those tracks onto an actual LP that we had pressed at Archer here in Detroit, um, just so that people who maybe didn't want to experiment with the lays could also end up getting the music, too. Um, I really think that's kind of the most important part of uh, the current noise scene is just the interest in getting the music out there, whether it be through touring, um, Another thing I wanted to bring up was basements. Uh, when you have a basement, you have your own venue, so you don't have to rely upon promoters, bookers, uh, you, you know, bar sales in order to get your band heard. You just have a show in your own basement, or you call someone in another town who has a basement, and you get the show together. And um, again, just another way of controlling the distribution of one's artwork. So this is the lathe box set that we put out. Um, each one of these records is cut in real time as the track plays on a recording lathe. It's the same type of machine that is used to make the master that then a plate is made to press the record, um, only this is like a kind of old 50s desktop version, so it really wouldn't be the same quality as a mastering machine. Um, but each, one, each record is one-sided. Uh, we do artwork, like sometimes silk screening on the back, and um, you can fit about three minutes of music onto a seven by seven inch piece of acrylic. Um, let's see. Let's get some this one is kind of translucent. Um, this is Burning Star Core, also known as Spencer Yeah, um, an experimental violinist and also does a lot of sound work just with his mouth. And this is also a lathe cut, but this is by um, Twig Harper, who runs Heresy um, Records out of Baltimore. He is actually from Ann Arbor and was kind of part of the early um, noise scene there and has since taken it on to Baltimore where he and also his brother have lathe cutting machines. Um, on this side, we've got a 78, a real heavy record that's been glued with this image of the Simpsons pinball machine. Uh, it's been manipulated a little bit to say your take your best shot at record collections. And on this side, you've got, um, a, I believe this is a 
what do you call it, a uh, acetate? I can't remember the word right now, but um, this is a, basically a laminated piece of cardboard, um, an actual old type of material that was used on these old dictaphone type lengths to cut records. Mm. Yeah. Don't those deteriorate really fast if you only listen to them a couple of times? Um, not in my experience. Maybe on like the softer types of old acetates. I, we did do one release that was on like those really thin, thin flimsy, waxy black um, acetates um, that are actually lacquer, not vinyl. And you definitely can't handle them a lot. Like your fingers are going to wear them. The finger oils are going to wear them down. But I've never had an experience in which I had to stop playing a lathe. I think that's a lathe myth. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a lathe cut record, but this is also a really interesting experiment um, with record cutting. And this is a more professional take. Um, but basically, um, Nate Young of Wolf Eyes was given uh, a blank to etch into, and then a plate was created from that. And this is um, what looks to be carved into the vinyl is actually pressed. Um, so it's a drawing that's been pressed into. And then uh, in addition, on top of that, grooves were pressed. So this is a playable etching, essentially. And it's kind of difficult to see, but I think I can, you can kind of see that there's other marks in there. Um, what is this? A bird and a jaw and a blade, I believe. Really, I have a lot of different things here, but I'm going to wrap it up because I think I've gone long enough. Um, I just wanted to point out one other thing, which is this television you see sitting here. Um, Carrie brought up really briefly uh, synesthesia. Um, I think that's a, another really, that's kind of my personal interest in the world of experimental music. And so I began um, experimenting with sound and um, its relationship with creating images directly from the sound. Um, through experimenting, experimenting with that, uh, Nate and I, um, along with Steve Kenny, we, were, we formed a band called Demons. And um, in that group, I uh, tried to actually create objects with which to create synesthetic experiences for the audience. Um, and so this is a television um, that's been manipulated to react to sound. Um, as you all know, a couple years ago, the analog broadcast ceased and it became digital only. So these little portable televisions were, you know, for all intents and purposes, obsolete. Um, even though I, I gotta just say, I hate the term obsolete technology. Um, I just think it's, you know, if you're using it, it's not obsolete. So. I saw that there was um, a really good opportunity. These TVs are particularly safe to um, manipulate because you're not going to electrocute yourself like with a larger television um, since these run on 12 volts. And um, basically through rewiring the photon tube, it reacts to sound you know, when it fires on the X and Y. So I'm going to plug that in and you can see how that looks. wanted to play a little dub intentionally too because I think that that's another sound um, you could consider dub the noise music of Jamaica it's really got a lot to do with really similar concepts to what's happening in a lot of experimental music as ter in terms of um, feedback and delay uh, the reamplification of signals um, and distortion so as you can see there you're basically seeing something like an oscillation but really it's just um, it's, it's that 
trick where your your mind wants to work with the sound. Um, while the photon tube is firing in time with the music, it's not pre precise the way an oscillator is. Um, and really, our minds are kind of great things in that they fill in a lot of the blanks for us and um, create synesthetic experiences for us um, when we are able to view things like this. So I think that's uh, about all I have to say. Okay, so we've, we've covered a lot of ground and we've gone a little longer than we anticipated. So, um, so I, I, I kind of feel inclined to just wrap it up unless anyone feels they, they have super important things to add right now. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground, as we said, and we've uh, probably touched on things. Oh. You know, I started living there when I was pretty young, like about 17, 18. And, um, you know, I got into a lot of the music there. Um, just a lot of it was from Freeform Radio, which, you know, Detroit used to have for years, but hasn't had for a long time, unfortunately. But I think, um, I think that's important is have something that's, you know, kind of propagating the culture. And, and um, you know, and I have a theory that the more you listen to something, however you know, damaging or annoying, it kind of becomes familiar to you and, you know, becomes enjoyable in a sense. So, um, well, that's another thing altogether, but yeah, but I, but I, you know, and, and Carrie might be able to address this too, being in Arbor, but yeah, no, I've, <laughs> I've been taping his shows, but, um, but yeah, I, th I think you know WCBN, which is a freeform station in Arbor, really had a huge influence on me as far as opening my ears to things that I normally never would have heard, you know, and you know, and then it just it, yeah, yeah, and WDT calls itself freeform. It's bullshit. Um, so I mean, they really, you know, Detroit needs something like that badly, you know. So that's all. Anyone else? Comments, questions? All right. So I think collectively what we can all agree is that we all sort of don't agree. But, uh, but you know, the idea is uh, expansive sounds and expansive ideas. And I think really what these things do is they open doors and they, and they you know, point us in, in new directions. And I think that's something that all of us do agree on, that, uh, you know, whether it be avant-garde or experimental or just pure noise, that we're just talking about ideas and and new sounds and sound art, sound art, art is sound, sound is music, music is sound, you know, jazz was noise once, uh, and now it's conventional music, it's music, and um, I think those ideas, you know, carry on, and, and, um, and it brings us to the moment that we're at now, which is this show tomorrow night with Hunting Lodge and Michael Deck and Lichens, which you should all come to so you can further understand what we're talking about. Anyone else? All right. Thanks for coming out. Have a good night.